you like this image being small like this? Yes. Yes? Because if the projector moves back, the image will be bigger. Yeah. Take away some of those photos. something like yes, that. Yes, one month. One month. So we did, this is the housewarming yes, party crashing event. Okay. Does everybody know everybody? No. Shh. Does everybody know everybody? Okay. That's great. little background on this topic. Um, since uh, 2010, uh, I started visiting China. And I've been continuing to visit China for more than two months every year since then. I find it interesting visiting China. And uh, one of the places that I go is in Kunming. Kunming is the nearest big city in China to India. So many of the devotees pass through Kunming to go to Mayapur because the flight from Kunming to Calcutta is two and a half hours, that close. And it's a really good place in many ways. It's kind of like Southern California weather in the sense that it doesn't get too hot and too cold. It's on the western side of a large mountain range, so it's kind of like, it's part of man, mainland China, but it's, you know, kind of not part of mainland China. It has a history because of its good weather, of being a kind of resort place for Chinese people. It has a history of many educational institutions. So it has a kind of liberal flavor to the population. So all around, it's, it's such a really good place for finding people that are interested in Krishna consciousness. So that's one of the places I like to go. And in Kunming, there's um, somebody who is really good at organizing, reaching out and meeting educated people and this and that without details. So uh, this presentation is part of a series of workshops. Um, after reaching out to new, new audiences in a in variety of ways, reading clubs, that's popular in China. Um, 
without all the, the details. So we, we kind of gather together a group of 30, 40 people that are, they, they, they want to learn more. You know, the kind of people that know that they don't know and know that they'd like to know. Those kind of people. So we had, the first workshop was on the art of meditation because um, like in America, there is a growing interest in meditation. There's already the wave of yoga has already covered China and continuing to grow. Big wave, yoga studios all over the place. Now, within the yoga studios, they're always looking for, you know, the new frontier to distinguish them from the other yoga studios. And meditation has become very popular. So part two, excuse me, part one of these workshops was the art of meditation. Then after, after that, the 30, 40 people, we wanted to do part two, so it was this one. The art of meditation, because in China, as in America, as in the world, uh, negative emotion is an industry, literally. And you'll see some statistics. Now, there, there are some graphics here that are specific for the Chinese population. It was created for that audience. It's not, it's only, not only for that audience, but that's just a little explanation of the background and why you'll see some of the graphics and some of the statistics that you see, because it, that was the audience it was created for. Um, the workshops went for two hours times four, so like Saturday morning, Saturday afternoon, Sunday morning, Sunday afternoon. <clears throat> we're going to go for about an hour and a half because we don't have to have translation into Chinese. It saves time. <laughs> it takes longer when you say and then it's got to be translated. Um, there are some parts of this that are exercises and discussion oriented and Basically, the, the, the purpose, the function of that is to take the information and bring it inside. So it's not just information in one ear and out the other ear and go home. And, you know, for, for the devotee community here and wherever else this has been presented, it's very practical. It's geared towards taking your japa, mantra meditation, and um, going to another level or helping you get on the obstacle of the mind, you know that one, the mind obstacle, to go beyond the obstacle of the mind, when chanting and through the medium of chanting. So this is for a new audience, it's not like, it's not a japa retreat kind of a message. It's, it's, it is what it is. The Art of Meditation, Overcoming Negative Emotions. And here's the four parts of the seminar series, or the weekend workshop. And we're going to be focusing on part one. What are negative emotions, understanding it. This is, you know, a little Sankhya section for the devotees. Part two, we're not going to do, that was a review of part one, you know, how to do mantra meditation. And in the afternoon session, we're going to cover part three, how through mantra meditation you can navigate your way through and on the other side of negative emotions. Very practical. Facing life's challenges. So a man on a boardwalk, he went for a stroll on a sunny day. And guess what? 
It rained. So we begin our day or we go down the path of life hoping for the best and sometimes it's not the best. Sometimes life has its challenges. And in our experience, sometimes it's financial, sometimes it's relational, sometimes it's occupational, sometimes there's a health, sometimes social interaction, etc. There, there's challenges that face us on the path of life. And sometimes those challenges look pretty formidable. <laughs> like, we're going to get whooped. Sometimes it looks like that. And the result is we feel imprisoned. We feel disempowered by those very negative emotions. And we become very invested in the emotion and trying to get struggle with the emotion. You know, very difficult. One of the professionals in this field, Dorothy Rose, says depression is like a prison where you are both the suffering prisoner and the cruel jailer. You can actually let yourself out of jail, you don't have to stay in jail, but it looks pretty bad when you're in jail. And even Arjuna, so helping a newer audience particularly, that a little bit, little bit familiar with Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna says, Better for me if the sons of Prithrashtra were to kill me unarmed and unresisting on the battlefield. Arjuna cast aside his bow and arrows, sat down on the chariot, his mind overwhelmed with grief. Arjuna, with his mind depressed, his eyes full of tears, Krishna spoke. Depression isn't a new thing. <laughs> and the range of negative emotions is very broad. And this image is meant to show that. Um, and it's not something foreign to any one of us. We all know what negative emotions are and what they feel like, at least some of them. Some of them it's a despairing sense of hopelessness. Sometimes it's a feeling of loneliness. I know some devotees, that's, they're caught in that feeling. Sometimes it's anger. I know some devotees that that's a problem for them. Not exactly looking like that. But, uh, a common one for people of this world is self-sabotage. We'll see this image again. Prabhupada spoke about it. This was in Mayapur. I was there in a, in a morning walk conversation. He was speaking about uh, his young Western disciples. He said, you like to flirt with Maya. You go out on a limb and see how far can you go before the limb starts to crack. And then you run back for the trunk of the tree. That's what you, that's what you Western disciples do. But it's not something someone is doing to us, it's something we're doing to ourselves. We're putting ourselves at risk and then saw the limb. Anxiety, and fear of un and uncertainty of the unknown, blaming, feeling resentment, why have they done this to me, etc., etc. So these are some examples of negative emotions, and there's more. This is an interesting um, study on consciousness. Now, it doesn't say specifically through meditation, but there's low consciousness, high consciousness, and um, 
vibration, I don't know exactly what vibration they were measuring, but uh, I find it interesting down here at the bottom, shame and guilt. And way at the top is higher consciousness where there's enlightenment. Just below that is gratitude. Even below gratitude is peace, joy, and love. And even below fear is shame and guilt. Just a little sharing. Um, somebody sent me a, a TED talk that I found interesting. I've, I've watched it multiple times. I've shared it with teenagers uh, particularly. Um, the, the person speaking is Benet Brown. By profession, she's a PhD in social work. And uh, you know, she, she's a researcher in, in um, social dynamics. And the, the title of it, you can find it, uh, look under, um, Vulnerability. And to, just TED Talk Vulnerability, and you, it'll take you there. And what she did for her PhD thesis is over a period of some years, six years or something, she studied what she calls in this TED Talk, the wholesome. And that's people that have gone beyond uh, the negative emotion phase. And she wanted to see what was particular about those people. And she found they were open to the idea of vulnerability. Now, what we were discussing in the morning class, and we'll continue to discuss, is um, it's, the, it's the bhakti process. It's, it's anything. Where well, you're going from where you are to where you want to go. There's this space in between. One of the terms that's used is liminal space. So you're, it's in Bhagavad Gita. Krishna, Arjuna says to Krishna, you're speaking this process of yoga. What if I take up this process of yoga and I don't make it? That I'm not, I'm neither there nor here, I'm nowhere, like a riven cloud. So that's vulnerability. And Krishna's reassurances, don't worry, the bhakti process is such that it stays with you, even if you don't complete it. In your next life you'll continue it, and you'll get a human birth in your next life. So, do yoga. Be vulnerable. <laughs> Be in your relationship with Krishna, it's perfectly fine if you don't reach perfection. I mean, try to get to that place. So, in Benet Brown's um, message, one of the things that prevents people from having relationships where there's trust in the person, knowing that the person is not perfect. I mean, who's perfect? Krishna is perfect. And the Shuddha Bhakta is perfect, and every one of the rest of us is something less than that. So, play it safe, don't have any relationships. No desire. Be a Buddhist. Go into this nirvana space and don't have any relationships. Don't have any suffering. Don't have any joy. Don't have anything. Just and that's not a sustainable position because that's not who we are. We're living entities that do have desire. So desire has to be directed with knowledge and wisdom and this, so, this higher consciousness place is the opposite. So she said people don't, the thing that holds people back more than anything is shame. That was part two of her TED talk, so the whole topic. The first one is vulnerability, the second one is shame, because that's what holds people back. It's low consciousness, and at the bottom of the pyramid of low consciousness, according to this study, and similarly, according to Benet Brown, is shame. I found that interesting. 
I normally think of fear as, I mean, of the animal propensities, fear is the greatest. If one is engaged in any one of the other three animal activities and something that's life-threatening comes along, you stop the other three and you do the fear one. You do the protection from harm. Anyway, this pyramid shows shame and guilt goes even lower and that's part, that's a negative emotion. I didn't make it, I'm not good enough, etc. We're going to be discussing this in the morning discussions also. Um, Gita values. So here's the higher consciousness, kindness. There's a happiness that goes with acts of kindness. We all know what that feeling is. It's a mode of goodness feeling. And joy, at least, you know, temporary material joy. Honesty, these are mode of goodness qualities that bring a certain contentment. Service to others brings a joy. Forgiveness brings, it's a higher consciousness position to take. And peace. So there's the neutral, sit by the side of the ocean and as the sun is rising and feel peaceful. And there's an inner peace that people strive for. So that's, this is a, these are higher consciousness qualities that take one beyond negative emotion. So now, um, what I did in China, I'm, I'm going to do it differently here because we're not in China. I had somebody who was um, a facilitator do facilitation, but I'm going to do this myself. Now what I would like to do, I, I like to like stand up and move around and kind of get the energy moving kind of thing. I'm doing, this is the professor position. <laughs> I'm going to get up and do the facilitator thing. Okay, I'll do it. So we're going to um, ask you to take a couple of minutes silently. And you, you, you can write it down if you like, or you can just contemplate. We're attending a, a two-part workshop, and this is a sankalpa exercise. Like, what do you hope to gain from here? Why, why are you here? Besides somebody say it's a good thing. Why don't you come? So it's a serious question, because Intention helps to focus attention. And we'd like attention to be applied so you can receive. Don't take two minutes silence and there's a couple more questions. But I'll, I'll, I'll wait till we do this one before we give you a couple more questions. This is introspection.
Some of you are looking up, which tells me mission accomplished. <laughs> <laughs> Who needs more time? Okay. Um, let me explain something and then we're going to move on. Uh, sankalpa is a, is a Sanskrit term. It, 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 its implication is intention or what do you want. A common place for sankalpa is in karmakanda rituals. You go to the priest and say, I want. And then he knows which ritual to perform and which mantras to chant and which deva to propitiate and so on and so forth. It's right in the Bhagavatam, Canto 2. If you want good health, you go over here, you worship the sun. If you want wealth, you go over there, you worship such and such. If you want so, sankalpa is intention, it has a function. And its function is to focus attention. It's, I likened it to um, a magnifying glass. And something that I did when I was little was I played with a magnifying glass by holding the magnifying glass at a certain angle and a certain distance from a piece of paper. And then there's the light of the sun that's everywhere, but the magnifying glass has this effect of bringing the light of the sun held at a right angle to a little spot. The spot will burn a hole in the paper. It's the same light of the sun that's everywhere. But the magnifying glass has the capacity of bringing it to a very focused position. But you have to pay attention. Because if you move magnifying glass, that little focused spot of light dissipates and doesn't have the same effect, doesn't burn anymore. So you have to pay attention to the position of the magnifying glass. Similarly, sankalpa means intention. And it helps focus your attention in something that you're doing so that you can get the result of what you want. But of course you're dependent upon Krishna. It's not just your attention and intention take care of everything. We're, we're dependent beings. The bhakti process also requires intention. Supposing you don't, you're not clear what your intention is. I'll give a little example. I was in college. I had a friend that had a sports car. And then sports cars were like, you know, nobody had a sports car. It was like, cool, he had a sports car. It looked a little miniature one. And every weekend, every Saturday, he'd go for a ride. So I asked him, when you go for a ride in your little sports car, where are you going? He said, just going for a ride. And my reply was, I hope you get there. <laughs> and I learned, having some facility, like we have a Maha Mantra, or we have a Bhakti process, or we have an opportunity to learn and focus how to get on the other side of negative emotions. So, you know, the, the clearer you are of what your intention is, like chanting Chapa every day. Try it. I invite you. Think about it between now and when you chant your Chapa tomorrow morning. Why am I doing this? Why am I putting my hand in my bead bag and chanting Chapa? You know, you have a basic idea, but the, the more clear your intention is, your Sankalpa is, then when you start chanting tomorrow morning, it'll be a different experience. It's the same mantra, but the experience will be different. And same with the bhakti process. We have a lifetime ahead of whatever, however many breaths and days and years. What's our intention? 
don't be clear, it'll be fuzzy. And be clear, at least it'll help you focus your attention to get the maximum effect of the years of your life of following bhakti process. That's a little blah blah about this little thing here. Your intention in, in, in coming here. So now, because the topic is negative emotion, take a couple of minutes. What repeated negative emotions do you experience? It's very telling. Because, you know, sometimes, and sometimes, sometimes it's hot, sometimes it's cold, and you feel it's too hot or it's too cold. But when there's something that, there's a negative emotion that occurs again, and again, and again, and again, it tells you something about something that's inside. The message is, mantra meditation can help you get on the other side, but it's good to know what the other side of what. And then, what positive experiences or emotions or connection with Krishna, whatever it is, you wish to access. We're going to take another couple of minutes because it's, it's good to have your intentions clear. I see some people looking up. Here's what I'd like to do next. Find an, one other person, pairs is best, and then you can share these three things with somebody and then hear from them that something, for, vice versa. This is, everybody likes to talk and share, so. <laughs> But it makes it, you know, real and practical. And if you don't have pairs, you have to do it in threes. Do it in threes. But okay, take it away. So my goal is that people should So my focus is on that. You need to Okay, so I'm always on the schedule, it's very high, so I shouldn't be very much. I guess people are just like being the only one being like the only one. Yeah, I mean like we are fighting. It's just um Yeah, but I'm still showing that it worked for me. 
Um, I think the cure is perhaps I just need my I guess I'm seeking that Yes, yes. Okay. You can continue at lunchtime. <laughs> So now we're going to explore a little bit what people who are, this is their profession, they look at negative emotions and they want to look at how to resolve them, so it's good to know where they come from. And using a computer analogy, they say that's basically three sources. Uh, the hardware, software, and the user. Our physical condition, our mental condition, and who we are, our conditioned self, at least, the user. So here's an, an image meant to show modern life. 
And in modern life, uh, there's lots of hardware improvements, but there's not a whole lot of software improvement. Um, more comforts, more conveniences, but lots of negative emotion. And here's some statistics. Mental disorders, this is clinical, going from 1968 to 2011, there's a noticeable rise. This is um, numbers per 100,000 people. So it's, 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 it's rapidly increasing mental disorders statistically. And those that study this subject call it a virus. Anxiety disorders are the most common mental illness in the U.S., affecting 40 million adults in the United States age 18 and older, or nearly one-fifth, 20% of the population. 300 million people around the world have depression. This is clinical now, not just like they feel down. Employees, this is now for China, at 50 of China's top companies in 30 cities, 78.9% of those surveyed showed signs of agitation, 59 plus percent reported anxiety, and 38 haunted by depression. That's a China statistic, not so different from other parts of the world. They call it a raging virus. 16.2 million adults in the U.S., that's 6.7% of all adults in the country, have experienced a major depressive episode in the past year. That's a big number. It's estimated that 15% of the adult population, that's U.S., will experience depression at some point in their lifetime, an estimated 3.2 million adolescents aged 12 to 17 in the U.S. had at least one major depressive episode. This number represents 13.3% of the U.S. population of that age group and nearly 20% of adolescent girls have experienced a major depressive episode. The U.S dollar amount is, is, a, is an industry, $210 billion per year. That's a big industry. If you want to get money, go into this one. <laughs> <laughs> I know somebody who is a practicing physician at Johns Hopkins University in the Baltimore area. And he, you know, attests it. It's, it's the fastest growing field in the field of medicine. Pharmaceuticals, you know, have new products all the time, da 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 da. And lots of people going into that direction. Aside from, you know, medical practitioners, there's uh, psychiatrists and that, that whole profession. So, how are they triggered? This, they, people who study this say it's mainly two main sources. Things that are outside of us trigger, and it's impression for our past experience that triggers. And an example of that is with this image here. It's not foreign to Sanskrit texts. Antakarana, maybe some of you know what that term means. It's, um, it's a term that applies to the mind, but it's the sum total of our mental impressions, kind of like your swabhava of the mind. It's the, uh, the, the tendency towards a certain um, emotion. So the image is somebody standing by the side of a, a lake somewhere, 
And for somebody it's a great adventure, and for somebody it's a source of fear. And it depends upon, a lot of it depends upon the antakarana, or the impressions from the past. So, um, supposing somebody had an experience in this lifetime or a previous lifetime where they died or nearly died, they had a horrible experience with fire. So all it takes is seeing a match and that triggers an emotion. And the parasympathetic nervous system takes over and they're on for a ride. I had an experience like that from my childhood. Just, you know, so it's not like it's other people. I had an older brother. He was nine years older than me. And you know how boys are. They would sometimes tussle. And so my brother had this practice when we would wrestle. He was nine years old. He always would win. And then he put a pillow over my head until I, you know, screamed, and then he took the pillow away. Because, you know, so it, it created an impression, a, a trauma impression that I didn't even remember, because when I grew up I didn't remember the, that experience. Until I was, we were in, in a high school field trip, we went to see uh, a, a fort something or other, and we went into a place where they had they kept prisoners and all the kids filed into the little space that they kept prisoners and I was towards the back and I got claustrophobic and I had to get out of there and I had to, so it was like I didn't have there wasn't there wasn't there wasn't there was nothing rational about it it's just my parasympathetic nervous system took over and I got out of there. You know, I knocked some people over to get out of there, but I had to get out of there because, you know, that antakarana was ruling. So sometimes negative emotions are triggered by past experiences that have really nothing to do with the circumstance. A match flame is not a, you know, a, a death-threatening, life-death-threatening circumstance but it triggers that emotion. So, so wait, I, there's, there's further examples, but you get the idea. Um, we should be aware that a negative emotion that we're experiencing today may have nothing to do with the circumstance it has everything to do with some past experience. And we need to resolve the emotion of the past experience, but it's difficult because it's embedded in your neurological system. And when your neurological system says, you don't disagree, <laughs> unless you're in this place of higher consciousness, and then you can. So now we're going to do uh, a little experiment. And here's the experiment. There's a, a maze, and we're, we're that person, imagine you're that person, and we're going to go for a little walk. Okay, so uh, now I'm going to stand up. I won't stand up because I have to have my laptop in front of me. So. Get in a comp this is an experiential thing. You ready? You gotta sit in a straight, you know, like yoga posture kind of thing. And, you know, get as comfortable as you can. You can do it in chairs too. And um, I'm gonna ask you to close your eyes and take five deep breaths like you're doing pranayama or something. Inhale. Deep inhale at your own pace and exhale five times.
Now your eyes remain closed, but we'll call it in your mind's eye. Some impressions are there, and consider what does your mind's eye see. What do you see? Some impression in your mind's eye. Someone might see your living room or your friend or your children or a loved one or someone that's important to you. Then, while considering what's in the mind's eye, take a step or two or three back and consider that you're the observer of that which is in the mind's eye. There's a spiritual you that's distinct from the mind and the vision within the mind. And whatever emotions are connected to that vision that's within the mind. And that's the you, the observer, the spirit, soul. That's who you really are. And stay in that space. A few more deep breaths. And then we can connect again. Open your eyes. And back to our topic. This is a little exercise that's a little journey that people that are in the field of helping people overcome negative emotion. It's not through mantra, but it's a practical way of helping people understand you're not the mind, and you're not the perception that comes within the mind, although it's through the senses it comes to the mind and the emotion connected with that perception. You're the observer. They speak like this. There's this inner television so there's an image showing a television screen and supposing the television screen is just blank. So, and then some images will show on the screen after some time if the television is working, the channel is tuned in. The mind is similar. There's an inner screen, but sometimes the inner screen doesn't at all relate to the outer reality. We see something, we feel something, and it really doesn't have anything to do with the outer reality. And in the case of negative emotion, in many cases, it has to do with our impression and not the reality that we're perceiving through our senses. It's in fact, completely, completely different. Here's one example. Uh, this is a lady that works at a, at a hotline. And one time she received a suicide call from a girl. And she asked what was the problem. And her boyfriend didn't answer her phone call. So she became suicidal. And so the hotline lady uh, ask just the right questions, you know, what were you feeling and why were you feeling what you were feeling. And it turns out that the girl that called in the hotline came from a broken home. And when she was little, that little girl, she felt abandoned by both mother and father. And so she was carrying that impression, that antakarana impression, that trauma impression, that had nothing to do with the fact that her boyfriend didn't answer her phone call. Just her antakarana experience emotion, that negative emotion got triggered by some past experience. 
So now we're going to do another little exercise. I'm going to stand up again. I'm going from the professor role now to the facilitator role. So I thought of having somebody here facilitate, but I forgot to like send this to you, so I have to do it myself. Okay, so um, give some thought, and then we're going to end up in, in a, a group. Or you can do it the one-on-one -on -one way that we did before, either way. But somewhere in the past where you have reacted to a situation that was either disproportionate to or completely different from reality. Now, another way you can do this is we have all, I've, I've surveyed audiences before. Have you ever had, the answer is yes. Have you ever had the experience where you've gone out of your way to do something that you mean to be an act of kindness for somebody and you find out they took it exactly the opposite of your intention? <laughs> it's like, what? <laughs> sometimes they share it and sometimes you don't find out till later. And it's like, wow. How'd that happen? And it has something to do with the impression and they perceived your intention in a totally opposite way than what your intention was. They were looking at the behavior according to some something within them. So now this is the other way around. Where you reacted to something that was disproportionate to or just totally different than the reality of the situation. Has that ever happened to you? And so Give it some time. Part of the idea of writing it down is it helps you get thoughts more clear, because to write it down it has to be more than just a random thought. So that's you know in your handheld device or on a piece of paper or however you like to do this. Some people resist writing things down, but I encourage you to write it down. It, it'll help. And then at the end, I'll, I'll ask uh, if you'd rather just volunteer and share three or four people, or sit and share with a partner, because I don't want people to be uncomfortable either way. Okay. And the sharing part doesn't necessarily have to be what the experience was and what you've... But it, it's, the question is, what did you learn from this little exercise? About that negative emotion and particularly going into the future, how to deal with one possible way to deal with negative emotions.
Okay, I'm going to interrupt your contemplation. While it's really interesting to hear from one another the misperception, what's more important, you know, the specifics, the anecdotal specifics of the misunderstanding or disproportionate perception of the, the, the reality of the situation. What can you learn from this? Like, check reality before you react. <laughs> or don't trust the mind. Because the mind has a tendency to misread things. Even if you're the, you know, the best of scientists. It's a known fact in science this same empiric data is read by one scientist one way, another scientist another way, and you read it differently according to your paradigm. So emotions similarly, it's a roller coaster depending upon how you read the situation. You may not even have the correct impression of the situation. The little match is not a, a, a life and death situation. It just doesn't match reality. Knowing that, still we have the tendency to rely upon and be ruled by and governed by the mind. That's when negative emotion takes over and rules us. It's in forgetting who we really are. So we haven't even yet touched on what we're going to do this afternoon, and you know, how does mantra meditation help you? This is just, these are some tools that people that like coaching people, that help people with negative emotions, get beyond just the reacting space of the negative emotion. Like, you know, knowledge and detachment. Jnana Vairagya. You know, start with some knowledge, please. And then you can, it'll help you with the detachment part. So, there's two things so far. I'm, I'm, I'm not doing the debriefing, I'm doing the professor thing. There's, you're not the mind, and then there's, the mind doesn't read the circumstance necessarily the way the circumstance really is. Don't trust the mind. It's not reliable source of information. We still have a mind, we can't like just anesthetize it permanently, have a lobotomy and you don't have any bad impressions anymore. No more negative emotions, no more emotions. That's not a practical solution. But beware of trusting the mind. So, anybody want to add anything to that little sharing part that I just did? Understanding others' perspective. Hmm. The situation might well happen. Maybe I'm, we are thinking in our own way, but we understand other perspectives of thinking. Then the situation will be more clear. So, what to do in that circumstance? That's that's the concept. What what's the practical behavior to do to match that concept? Ask the other person. Well, here's another one. Share your perception. When this happened, this is what I felt. That's novel. Now you're not holding the other person responsible for your emotion. You're responsible for your emotions, not somebody else. But let the other person know, when this happened, these, I, this is what I perceive happened, this is what I felt. And they can say, oh my gosh, I didn't know you felt like that. Or, oh my gosh, when I said this, this was my intention. Oh. <laughs> well, that's nice to know because I perceived it differently. Okay, any other, this last debriefing, what did you learn from this little exercise.
Anyone else want to share anything? Yes. Question, Maharaj. So many times we don't know where it is coming from the past experience. Yes, that's right. So. That's okay. It's good to know <clears throat> that you don't know. <laughs> and it's good to know that that may be, not necessarily, it may be where it's coming from. Something back there that I don't know what it was. But here comes this emotion. And when you're, when you're in that I don't know and I'd like to know space, there's some, there's some neutrality or detachment. It doesn't necessarily change what the emotion is, but you can be detached from the emotion. This happening can be raging, but you can be detached from the emotion. If you know that you don't know and it's coming from some place in the past that I don't know what that something was. Knowledge and detachment. It's 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 a it's not a it's not a cure to the emotion. But it's a, you don't get carried away by the emotion. So that's like the next slide. That's for people that are involved in this uh, field of negative emotion. They call it the avalanche effect. Something that becomes overwhelming. The mind magnifies stuff. And I learned this from visiting, I visited a place, I ha in the past I visited a place where there were big mountains and there were occasional avalanches and I learned from the local people what they do, you know, what starts an avalanche. And commonly, not always, there's a lot of light snow. So before the persons even approach that mountain that has lots of light snow, one of the things they do is they fire a, a, a gun and it hits towards the top of the mountain. What that does, it agitates the snow that's light at the top of the mountain and it starts to fall. And sometimes that little bit of snow that falls builds and builds and then you get the avalanche. But if they fire and it doesn't create an avalanche, then it's safe. It's just a precaution. But it's how, it's, how avalanches start. A little bit of snow up there, and it falls on light snow below, and it comes down and people get buried. Or whatever is in the way gets buried. And that's, the mind has this avalanche effect, and it's discussed in Bhagavad Gita, no surprise. Right from the Bhagavad Gita, there's the process of thinking that comes from the contemplation of an object, right? You contemplate an object and there's some thoughts about the object, and then from that thoughts about the object, you have some emotions about the thought, connected with the thought, and then sometimes there's, if it keeps going, there's an obsession. I have to get something or I have to get rid of something there's a happiness or a distress factor than pursuing the happiness or relief of distress factor. And it becomes an obsession. And sometimes obsession leads to destructive actions. You feel self-trapped, that image in the beginning of the man is in prison, gotta get out of here, or that claustrophobia, or here's the fire, or here's some water, or here's something, and it becomes an obsession. You have to relieve yourself of that intense emotion and it can lead to some, something very destructive. So it's good to ask yourself the question, back to Rasamrita, you know, I, I, I may not know what that past thing is, but there's is this present, is the perception and the emotion connected with the perception connected to something in the past? And that pause space helps one make a distinction between the self and the mind, just like the, the distinction between the mirror image and the person who is in the mirror image, the person who is holding up the mirror. 
the mind can be like that. And when that detachment happens, then that emotion, you don't have to tuck the emotion under the rug or run away from it or pretend it doesn't exist. With intelligence you can redirect. With intelligence you can direct the mind. Supposing, for example, somebody says something mean and you feel something. So, there's an emotion. You feel some emotion, whatever that emotion is, when somebody says something mean. Now, you have some options if you're in this detached space. You're not that emotion, whatever that emotion is that you're feeling. You, you, you're, the emotion was triggered by someone's mean speech. Now, I can redirect that negative emotion. It's certainly a possibility if you're, if you're practiced at it. Like, here's a, here's a possibility of, of the, out of a menu of possibilities. Here's a person who is pained a whole bunch. And because they're pained a whole bunch, they're speaking really mean. They're acting from a place of, their anger is coming from a place of pain. I don't know what that pain is that that person is undergoing that's causing them to speak and behave in this mean way. So how can I be of some service to this person who is undergoing this pain and therefore speaking mean words? And you may not have an answer to that question, but it, you're redirecting the emotion to a mood of service instead of otherwise. Here's a Bhagavad Gita verse where Krishna speaks on this point. The senses are so strong and impetuous, O Arjuna, that they forcibly carry away the mind, even of a man of discretion, who is endeavoring to control them. So you can try, maybe even be practiced at what I just described. But it's not going to be sustainable unless there is purity. And so, here comes a little video clip created by a teenager to show how the, the body and the mind and the heart need alignment. This is what happens when there's purity. of the body and the mind and the heart leads us to this place of higher consciousness, Gordon Hill. And we can be in the midst of any circumstance of practical life be situated in this place of higher consciousness or Krishna consciousness connected to Krishna. That's the yoga system. It's not just mechanical restraint of the mind and senses, but it's um, being situated in a condition of purity where this higher consciousness is something that you live with. and. That's Bhagavad Gita's teaching, and that's what mantra meditation combined with the knowledge of Bhagavad Gita helps us achieve. Prabhupada writes this from Srimad Bhagavatam. The soul's designation, the mind, is the cause of all tribulations in the material world. As long as this fact is unknown to the conditioned living entity, he has to accept miserable conditions of the material body and wander within this universe in different positions because the mind is affected by disease, limitation, illusion, attachment, greed and envy. It creates bondage and a false sense of intimacy within this material world. Now this is from 5th Canto Bhagavatam. There's a whole chapter 
In the tenth canto Bhagavatam, Krishna has talked with Uddhava that says the same thing in much more detail. So, now how this connects with mantra meditation is it helps make the mind pure, or it's our path. Cheto darpanam arjanam, making the mind pure so that we can then be connected to the heart, at least potentially, and through sound vibration, getting in touch with who we really are. So that's uh, a lesson in what negative emotions are. That was the title of this part one. What, what is the negative emotion? How, do it, how does it arise? How can we help overcome? And ultimately, how does mantra meditation help us? Because it puts us in touch with who we really are. The, the, the potency is there to do so by cleansing the mind. And it doesn't work just by, you know, conceptual thinking about it. It's a consciousness that has to be awakened. And the potency is there in the mantra to awaken that tendency, inclination to be in service to Krishna or in our relationship with Krishna where we're serving him with all of our faculties and all of our resources and whatever it is that he has given us. Including even, you know, dealing with our negative emotions in a way that is helping us to achieve this goal of Krishna connection. So that's an uh, introduction. And see if there's some discussion. Now the schedule clock is not telling the correct time. Yeah, it's a little. It's about one to people. So, yeah. So we have some time. We have a few minutes, anyways. And any discussion on what we've done so far? Because we're going to go on to part two this afternoon. Yeah. Towards the end, you showed us a slide on how to be properly situated where we don't identify with the emotion but trying to realize our true identity. With yeah. Identifying with it. Yes. My question is um, sometimes one may not know uh, devotees. People, devotees who are guiding us, they tend to see something which one cannot see within, one cannot know about oneself. Okay. So, when devotees mention something which is difficult for one to take, how does, uh, how does one uh, not have negative emotions or accept the reality without having to undergo this negative emotion? Or one shortcoming. The, the, the short answer is purity, and without purity, you're not going to get there. But it's not like purity means okay, I just close my eyes and jump. You you know, you 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 can. There's many options when that situation arises. You can. One option is you say back to the person who is seeing things that you don't see. A, at this point in time, I don't see that. Or, or another way of saying the same thing is, let me sit with this. And I'd like to get back to you on this. And you, you know, not just blind acceptance, but you consider carefully. And then there may be some further dialogue on that point with, with the person who's guiding you and you can, you know, it, when it's an honest dialogue, an honest exchange, not a judgmental one or a reactionary one, either way, then you can get it to a refined understanding of the real situation and then steps to deal with it. Maybe the perception is uh, not taking certain situations into consideration. Can be so many maybes. So, but you know, your specific question is how to not get caught in the negative emotion when you hear 
something that you can't see. That was your specific question. Yes. You know, you look at different options. There's that emotion, I'm feeling that, that you know, the, the potential of feeling that emotion, at least in the past. So now what are some other options for me? You consider. Consult the person, you know, some, just like you're doing right now. Sometimes I'm in this space. Sometimes you say, you see something that I don't see. Here's an example, but I don't want to just focus on the example. I want to understand how to, how to move forward when those situations arise. But here's an example, so you know what I'm speaking about. You, you, know, you have a relationship with this person that's guiding you. And there, there needs to be some trust. It's not like that person has to be a perfect person. Otherwise you can't give any, invest any trust. That's this liminal, excuse me, this vulnerability message. You have to have something guiding you. And it's not that that somebody guiding you has to be Krishna, you know, a perfect person, or Shukadeva Goswami or a perfect person. They have to be following and you know, worthy of your trust. We need such persons in our lives and you, then you have some dialogue, just as Arjuna did with Krishna. It may not come quickly. It's okay. Invest in the relationship and trust in Krishna and, you know, it'll come out in the way. Because Krishna is the agent of purification. The other person may be the instrument, but Krishna is the agent of purification. In God we trust. <laughs> Trying to understand, you mentioned the cause of negative emotion is either our own mind or because of our born and brought up situations. Yes. This is not Bhagavad Gita Uvacha. This is people that practice in this field say these things. I want that clarity. clarity. So, but go ahead. And uh, like our contemplation and then we develop attachment. So there yes, that's in Bhagavad Gita. Right. <laughs> so many reasons for negative emotion and then you mentioned we can once we disassociate ourselves with the mind and the body and the senses. Yeah. Like the, we are separate from the mind and the yes. mind. Yes. Jnana Vairagya. Or as Sarva Bhumabhatacharya said. Vairagya Vidya Nija Bhakti Yoga. You know the verse? Shikshartam ekam purushapurna. He's glorifying Lord Chaitanya, and the first line is Vairagya Vidya. Now it's not like Lord Chaitanya is teaching to be a jnani. Just become with knowledge and you get detachment. That's not his. But there's knowledge that naturally comes with bhakti. There's knowledge that naturally comes with bhakti. Vasudeva Bhagavati Bhakti Yoga Prayojataha Janiyati Ashu Vairagyam Jnanam Cha Yadahaitukam From Bhakti, costlessly knowledge and detachment come. But knowledge and detachment are elements of, or components of, or instruments of Bhakti. So we need, when we perceive with bhakti, there has to be knowledge and detachment. But driven by bhakti, not driven by, I don't want to suffer. That's, that's not going to take us to beyond suffering. It's going to take us to more involved into the material energy, struggling. Bhakti means Krishna is to be pleased. That's our, that's our mission.
by loving service. And we need instruments that are pure. So we need we need to make our instruments pure, mind and senses. More? Yes, I'm, yeah. I'm trying to see um, how you're presenting as mantra meditation as a solution to overcome negative emotions. Yes. Is it like we're, we're not there yet. That's that's the afternoon session. <laughs> but it's purity. Purity leads to overcoming negative emotions. And purity that leads to overcoming negative emotions has this, this detachment in it. When the mind says, ah, we don't have to go there. But it's not just by, you know, being a stoic. It's by bhakti that it awakens from the chanting, I want to be in Krishna's service, please. That's what the mantra means. Please engage me in your service. And that awakening of please engage me in your service emotion can... The light goes on and the negative emotion goes down. I can manage or overcome. But it takes purity. And then I have to do some managing of the situation with the tools given. Yes. Well, the image of like negative emotions being over, um, like the image, like the negative emotions being very high. Uh, so all of us just thinking is these are goal to overcome the negative emotions. No. Or is no. Like a, it's a byproduct. Okay. So, but like, uh, so when the negative emotions come, sometimes it's not that we won't be in a position. At least I won't be in a position to remember all those stuff at that time, is that... that if, if you're situated in bhakti, whatever you need to remember, Krishna will give you that remembrance. You don't need to remember the steps. The steps helps us understand the science of it, but bhakti is spontaneous and natural. But knowledge may help you, when, especially when you're stuck. Sometimes people get stuck. Maybe you sometimes, maybe you know, some of your dear friends get stuck. Maybe your son gets stuck, I don't know. But the, bhakti can, is, is the ultimate. And, there, and the, there are other things that may be resources that help move down the bhakti path when one is stuck. So, but that's how, the, there's a science to it all, it works. You just do it in slow motion, it'll look like this. <clears throat> it's, let's just take, you know, apart from this negative emotion thing, creation. The Bible says, old, in, in Genesis, the Old Testament, God said, let there be light. And there was, and it was good. Okay, then there's a slow motion of all that. Because in the universe is a place of darkness. There's a shell. And it's dark inside. When Brahma was born, it was darkness and all that. So, where does light come from? There's details. It's not that you can't go back to Godhead unless you know those details. So is that like moving towards the light or moving towards the spirituality those these comes helps us overcome. Yes. Knowledge helps in detachment. Attachment to darkness is the negative emotion. And to overcome the negative emotion it helps to not be attached to darkness but be attached to light. Tamasima Jyotir Kama. Back to Godhead. That comes from that phrase. So what does light look like? What does darkness look like? Okay, let's go to the light. Now you don't have to know all that stuff to go to the light. Just chant Hare Krishna and be happy. So that's sufficient. And the other things are, they're, they, uh, they're attendant 
principles that help, especially when you get stuck. And we're conditioned souls, we have a tendency to be stuck. We're rowing the boat and keeping the anchor down and we're not getting, so you pull the anchor. Ah, anchor down, what's that anchor look like? Here's what it looks like, oh, thank you. Now I can go. Moving the intention. Yeah, yeah, yes. And fo and holding it there. The yeah, then then the you know the, the process of bhakti burns the the, the the stuck position. But then there are things that we need to do along with that intention. You have to do some managing of you know, principles of life. The body and the mind and the heart. But the power, the locomotive that's pulling the train, is bhakti. And then there's cars following the locomotive. Yeah. Um, can you help me to understand the... Uh 